Hi everyone, thanks for joining in. I think we will go ahead and start now. Hi, my name is Yashwardhan Rajan and thank you for joining us today for a Carnegie Mellon University speaker event, uh, Transforming India, Building Smart Cities. Joining us today is an outstanding pioneer and fellow CMU alumni, Amrita Chaudhary, who's the co-founder and director of Gaia Smart Cities. And before we start, I would like to introduce our CMU alumni head, uh, uh, Mumbai chapter head, sorry, Rekha Koita for a few opening comments uh, and welcoming Amrita, our attendee. And also introduce uh, Anshul Bhargava, who's gonna be working with me uh, for the Q&A section later on, Rekha. Thank you, Yash. Uh, a very warm welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us today for this event. Um, thank you very much, Amrita, for taking time out of your schedule to address our uh, CMU alums, as well as, uh, you know, there are a lot of people from other networks and groups who have joined. So I'm sure they're going to find this a very interesting evening and something very different. Um, and thank you, Yash and Anshul, for all the effort that you've put in to, you know, to get this event together. Uh, so thank you, everyone. And... You know, Amrita, as many of you would have read in all the, you know, the flyers and the emails. So, of course, she is our alum from uh, Tepper School of Business, CMU. She's where she's done her MBA, but she's also from IIT Kanpur, UC Berkeley. She is the founder of uh, Gaia Smart Cities, and that's what she will be talking about today. But she has, you know, several other accomplishments to her name. She has, uh, I think, seven U.S. patents. She's been on the board of several co companies. And I think what I find interesting also is that, um, you know, amidst all this uh, technical work and, you know, um, you know, all the cutting edge technology that she's involved in, she's also an author of two fiction books. I think that's the interesting, uh, you know, uh, part which also I wanted to throw in. Well, I think you're all waiting to hear more from Amrita. So let me not take much time. I'll hand it back to, uh, hand it over to Yash. And uh, Yash, please take it forward. Thank you. Great, Th thanks a lot, Rekha. I mean, just going off of what Rekha said, Amrita has really achieved a lot um, from, from her history and in, in, in the educational sector, but also from the work perspective, right? Like she's been the ex-associate director of Harvard Business School, was the ex-CEO of DY Works, which is Future Group, worked at Harlequin South Asia. And now she has started a company that's really revolutionized how we think of India and the way India is transforming. I mean, coming to today's day and age, it's, it's really amazing to see like with COVID and lockdowns, one of our very own alumni really being able to push forward, push the boundaries to improve what we know as India, create these things that we call smart cities. And of course, we'll discuss it a lot more in detail as, as we move forward. But beyond that, it's just incredible to have her be a part of this organization. She started Gaia Smart Cities back in 2015, which is only about six years ago. And the focus was really to create an environment where we like kind of where we live and how we live by enhancing distributed operations and infrastructure management. And what really works is that, what's really crazy is that in just six years, Gaia Smart Cities now has, like covers and monitors over 90 million square feet of developed areas across several sectors, right? We have retail, transport, healthcare, and industrial cold chain, I, the list goes on. And more than that, over 440 million square feet, which is 10,000 acres, of urban cities, urban city areas. That's over that to over a hundred plus cities. And she's done this by really bringing in the power of the Internet of Things, smart uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, automation to create these smart cities. But hey, instead of me trying to sound smart, let me let me leave it off to the pro, and let Amrita really tell us more about smart cities and and we move forward. Just a quick format. We're doing about 40 minutes or so of, of an introduction to smart cities and, and what it really is and how it helps us today. And then we move into an interactive Q&A where you, any of the attendees can ask uh, Amrita a question, um, either over video or audio. Um, for your questions, please drop them down in the chat box below. I think it should be on everyone's screen to be able to drop a question in there. And yeah, Amrita, please go ahead. Uh, Yash, uh, Reka, and Anshul, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Delighted to be here uh, to talk about uh, uh, smart cities and smart infrastructure. 
So as uh, like, you know, Yashio started mentioning, um, like, you know, smart uh, cities obviously have been around, the concept has been around in India for the past uh, several years. And interestingly, like, you know, we uh, founded, um, like, you know, we founded uh, Gaia in the same year that uh, the mission actually being. And um, so with that, like, you know, we became one of the early companies who had brought together the skills and the understanding uh, that is needed in this domain and we continue to do a lot of work right but uh, like you know i'll talk more about that as uh, we go through the conversation but let's let's look at like you know what really is uh, uh, what's a smart city so if we look at smart cities like you know the first thing that comes into our mind is this totally wired up and connected city where uh, every aspect of the city function has some amount of tech enablement in it it is uh, bringing together uh, uh, like you know the people and the systems and the processes in a way such that uh, you know your transport is uh, and like you know your uh, utilities your water management environment uh, all of that like you know all of the city functions and services are working seamlessly uh, working on time working like uh, uh, within budget and working like you know like to deliver service to you uh, of the utmost quality and with the highest of service levels that you can, you can imagine right like you know so that's really what the vision is and then the vision is that you're really connecting all of these with uh, different kinds of sensors different kinds of like you know communication uh, protocols uh, different ways in which data comes in into a central command and control center and then the city functions as this uh, unified being where uh, you know information from uh, traffic lights can actually impact safety or transport or in information from transport can impact your waste management and waste collection vehicles and so on right so that's really what the utopian dream is but now let's uh, decode as to what really is happening in and uh, like you know how our goal is really uh, like you know like uh, different sometimes so first of all like you know let's understand what really is smartness so when we think of smartness we think firstly it's tech enabled right and just implementing technology or implementing the sensors and the hardware and the software that goes along with it doesn't really make a city smart so what is smart really our definition is that smartness is an iterative thing so it's not about deploying the technology it's about using the technology to see what's happening in the city system so whether it is uh, your transport systems whether it is your uh, waste collection systems or like an you know, electrical uh, like an you know, electricity distribution systems what is happening like you know how are users using it what is like you know like uh, what's the behavior and then using that data to make corrections make improvements and thus like you know making it a lot more like you know of a conscious city which is using that data for a purpose like it's not just data for the sake of data and that is always, you know, it's a process, it's a gradual process. And even some of the best cities around the world are probably still on that continuum where they are moving towards becoming conscious, where they are moving towards become, becoming a lot more sentient and probably, uh, you know, much more than the US uh, or European cities. Some of the Asian cities, if you look at like, you know, like uh, Seoul, if you look at uh, Tokyo, they would actually qualify a lot more as conscious cities uh, than any others. Now, if we look at the context for India, I mean, we think of the 100 smart cities, uh, which was announced via the mission. Uh, but there is also like, you know, work and projects happening in what is called the 4041 urban local bodies, which uh, cover the rest of India. And uh, pretty much like, you know, every municipal corporation that you can think of is part of this, uh, like, you know, 4041 urban local bodies. Then there is the whole smart villages program. And, and like, you know, there's mil millions of villages across India where different kinds of programs are happening. Uh, just to give you an example of like, you know, the kinds of uh, things that are happening in the villages. Uh, so um, there's been a government program for the last uh, few years. Uh, where initially they were working with uh, like you know different educational institutions and then like it's been uh, ruled out now with uh, some of the private sector firms as well uh, where they uh, initially they started looking at satellite data uh, that they have uh, I mean, uh, you all know that uh, like you know we have uh, uh, 
to ISRO, like you know, the satellites which are monitoring um, you know, every uh, region within India. And through the satellite data, using a lot of AI and analytics, they were trying to map different things, uh, ground cover, forest cover, uh, like you know, water levels, in uh, like you know in different kinds of water bodies uh, different kinds of village assets now that project is being uh, like you know taken to the next stage where they're going to use drones and drone technology to do uh, finer grain mapping of uh, village level assets right so uh, so these are all different kinds of projects which are uh, happening at the village level like you know we uh, you probably heard of the smart fiber going into each uh, that becomes the backbone of uh, many of these initiatives. Uh, so it's it's not really just the smart cities. There's a whole uh, slew of projects which are spanning agriculture, water supply, solid waste, um, like you know, uh, environment, a lot of like you know, safety and security and transport related things, where lots of devices are being put. So if uh, like you know, many of you are from Mumbai, and in Mumbai, for example, if you look at uh, uh, the gas company and the smart, um, like, you know, like uh, the piped gas, which is coming into uh, many of our homes. Now that has become smart with a lot more of uh, smart metering that has been put in place over the past year. And, uh, you know, so that's just one example of how uh, smartness can be included in a running system or a running, uh, uh, like in you know, a solution that a city is offering. Now, when we think of smart, sometimes like, you know, we think that smart means, means high tech, right? It always means high innovation. So uh, there's a lens that uh, like, you know, has been put together by um, economists and uh, business scientists, which really looks at where do we place innovation and where do we place like, you know, the smartness for smart cities? And there are obviously things which are high investment and high innovation. So if we look at any of the, uh, like, you know, uh, video-based surveillance projects, which in many cities right now right so that obviously is high investment because you need like you know high uh, grade cameras you need high grade connectivity fiber uh, cables uh, a lot of like you know like uh, um, uh, infrastructure at the central command and control center very high end analytics are being used so it's really a high investment high innovation um, like you know like a scenario but there are equally and more so in a country like india uh, opportunities for doing low investment and low innovation ideas and we'll talk through some of those and uh, if we look at the way structured their projects right each city uh, chose a set of different ideas to work on uh, through the mission and they've been a combination of high investment ideas and low innovation low investment ideas you know sometimes just creating or uh, like in a redesigning a junction uh like you know the junction uh like you know like uh, um uh, you know the uh, dividers are uh, created uh, the way that the placement of the traffic light the placement of the pole which are low investment things and low innovation things can actually impact the traffic in the city significantly right so there has been like you know, there have been several projects where uh, while you're looking at the high end of uh, integrated traffic management system with uh, uh, like you know the automated light controls and the automated signaling systems and so on but there have been areas where you've done uh, where cities have done junction redesign which uh, like you know just requires a little bit of like a you know, civil infrastructure and re-looking at the traffic flow patterns to uh, see what would work for that junction how can this junction be made uh, like you know better how can we traffic density and the traffic uh, stoppage at these junctions right? so there are many many different ideas that uh, like you know cities have uh, taken through so uh, what the government of india had done and uh, like you know, just uh, to give a little bit of our background and history uh, so when the mission had been set up uh, bloomberg foundation which had initially like you know mayor bloomberg had worked on the city of new york he founded his uh, Bloomberg Foundation and the foundation worked with the government of India in designing some of the early tenets of the smart city mission as to how it would uh, like in a look at urban transformation and the uh, view that was uh, kept in there was this view of incrementalism which means that in a country like India you don't really need everything which is absolutely high-tech so you need in many cities basic things 
basic services like water, sewage, transport, waste management. And cities made sure that enough budget and effort was put in to things which were called basic services. Then, like, you know, was the next stage. Like, you know, how do you ease certain things? Like, uh, like you know, what we talked about, transportation, transport flows, uh, increasing the uh, sustainability, uh, like, you know, and the security level of each city. Uh, going from there to the next level, like, you know, what kinds of uh, technologies can be included to improve the basic services and, uh, like, you know, the uh, uh, additional services. And then finally, like, you know, in some areas, in some components, like, you know, we have looked, Indian cities have looked at creating these integrated platforms, like, you know, which are very complex. So uh, we'll uh, see, like, you know, how many of these cities have created this, um, like, you know, integrated control and command centers, where many of, uh, uh, like, you know, where all of these, um, like, you know, services are being manned, data is coming in, in real time, and, uh, like, you know, people are using these, uh, like, you know, this information to take decisions, and using this information, like, you know, very effectively also to uh, respond to some of the COVID-19 challenges. So again, going back to uh, like you know the design stage, like you know uh, once when you're looking at designing a smart city, and let me just differentiate like you know there are what we call brownfield cities. So the hundred smart cities vision was really looking at the brownfield cities. So a uh, city like Agra where we worked, or like you know like Aurangabad, Lucknow, uh, um, like you know like Bangalore, Chennai. These are all brownfield cities where the city is in existence, and they have existing municipal corporations, existing departments, uh, existing set of services that they offer to the people. And in such a city, how do you uh, take it to the next level of including smartness? And then there are what are called greenfield cities so uh, i mean like i've worked on um uh, auric which is shendra bitkin part of the delhi mumbai industrial corridor uh, one of the cities which has uh, come up there have been other cities vikram Udyopuri, that we had worked on uh, earlier so these are all greenfield cities where uh, it's just land right so you're uh, working uh, very closely with the master planners on some of the trunk technology that will go in at that master planning stage and then the technology really like you know adds up uh, as the cities like you know sort of go off the ground right uh, so different ways in which you tackle technology for both of them but like you know when you're looking at a city um, and uh, like you know when the smart cities mission was looking at the city like you know they were uh, saying that you have to look at many different parameters like you, know, you have to say like you know a uh, like you know what are the financial metrics of the city is the city actually making money off like you know like uh, the services that it's offering and you'd be surprised to know that only a handful of cities actually make money in India uh, Mumbai being the most cash rich uh, and Maharashtra having like you know the largest one of uh, like in you know, a number of cities which are cash positive cash flow positive and uh, like you know, uh, Mumbai, Pune, Pimpri Chinchwar, like you know, these are all like you know, cash rich uh, cities with budget surpluses. But most other cities in India actually run at a loss and are provided for by the government. Right? So they don't make enough through uh, taxation and revenues to actually pay for the services that they're offering to their citizens. Next comes like, you know, like what are the unique elements, like, you know, the geography, the cultural aspects, the economic aspects, like, you know, what's important for the city, like, you know, what sort of manufacturing or trade logistics or agriculture or tourism, like, you know, does that city, like, you know, provide a base for. And all of that led into the city defining its goals. The goals uh, were defined by most cities, uh, not just by the stakeholders, which were the administrators, but also by uh, taking in responses from citizens and getting citizens to uh, give in their ideas, vote on ideas, like, you know, and so on. Uh, there were some state goals, state-led goals. There were some other reform agendas, which, like, you know, fed into uh, the overall plans. And each city, like, you know, it was the first time that any city in India did uh, what is called an organized planning, right? So, uh, what we do in the private sector a lot like you know we put together plans we put together scenarios we do SWOT analysis we uh, create like you know budgets and uh, like you know we create like you know these five-year uh, ten-year plans of what this uh, like you know what the business is going to look like cities in India did this pretty much for the first time and uh, like you know some of the reasons why uh, it took uh, long for many of the cities to go uh, through the first hurdle which was actually getting their plan approved was because they did it for the first time 
right? So out of the hundred in the first lot, um, like in about six months, uh, 20 cities got their plans uh, approved by uh, government of India and by uh, uh, the smart cities mission, then another 20 and then like, you know, sort of another 40. And then finally, like it took almost and three to four iterations of their plan submission for the last set of cities to actually get their plans approved. And the plans, like, you know, like, uh, uh, had to consider many things, right? Like, you know, the plans had to look at uh, uh, different kinds of scenarios, what kind of overall budgets uh, they were looking at, what was the vision of the city, uh, how would that, uh, like, you know, and from that vision, like, you know, what sort of uh, component services would get impacted. Each city looked at something which would, uh, you know, uh, some elements which would cover every area of the city so that it was there was something in it for every citizen and then they they each city like you know, chose a particular area where they had some specific uh, like you know solutions as well for so um if you uh, like you know um, uh, know navi mumbai then navi mumbai has like you know like uh, uh, Palm Beach Road area and like you know they uh, chose some of the things around that area in Agra they chose uh, like you know the area in and around the Taj uh, not just the tourist areas but also the residential like you know areas the town of Agra is, is called for some of these area based uh, like you know things that they looked at so from the plan uh, there were some 16 core areas emerged um, and each of these areas had different levels of tech inclusion in it, right? So if you look at some things like housing or open greens and so on, uh, these are really low technology areas. But obviously, like, you know, they're very important for a city uh, uh, to include um, low cost housing, uh, housing improve, uh, improvements, looking at, uh, like, you know, green parks, uh, looking at, uh, like, you know, revitalization of some of the uh, public areas, riverfronts, um, like, you know, like uh, beachfronts and so on, were very important for cities. So they looked at that. Uh, areas which were very, uh, like, you know, they uh, uh, were um, using a lot more of technology were things like governance, e-governance, uh, and especially, like, you know, looking, uh, once you're looking at uh, data coming in, uh, how do you use that data? How do you manage the data? Like in you know, a lot of governance, uh, like you know, came in there, transportation, water supply, energy. Like you know, these were all like you know, major areas in which, and safety and security. These were all like you know, like uh, major areas where a lot of technology uh, came in. While health came in as a um, uh, like you know, like uh, uh, an area where the technology inclusion was high. What emerged out of uh, like, you know, um, the post COVID analysis was that the amount of budget that had been actually allocated towards health and digital health, as well as education and digital education was actually very small. Right? So large fractions of the budgets of each of these cities really went into governance, into transport and mobility, safety and security, water supply, uh, sanitation, waste, and waste management, right? So those were really the big chunk areas that most cities like, you know, put in a lot of money in. On the uh, civil infrastructure side, a lot of like, you know, money was put into the open greens and public housing and so on. Health, identity and culture, education, uh, while like, you know, they were really low budget areas and like, you know, emerged as areas where in the next phase cities should um, allocate more budget towards them. So, uh, moving on. So, when we look at creating a smart city, right? Like, you know, when we're looking at a uh, greenfield city, uh, the first thing that comes in is master plan, right? You Because there is nothing over there. It's just land. So, how do you do, like, you know, land aggregation? How do you do land parceling? Like, you know, how do you like in you know, a zoning, uh, how do you do the urban master planning? Like, you know, where should the trunk infrastructure go? All of that is part of, uh, like, you know, the level one of creating a, um, like, you know, like new city. Now, um, that's something that, that part of it did not really happen for these existing hundred smart cities, because these were all brownfield cities, existing cities. Um, I mean, and uh, like, 
Tennessee was one of the cities that we had worked on, for example, in the uh, first phase. So of the 14 in the first phase, uh, which was the Smart Cities Challenge Plan, we as Gaia had worked with 14 of them to de uh, define and design their uh, technology uh, plans. So, uh, I mean, in a city like Varanasi, obviously like you know like there were some things which were cutting across the city but the things which were uh, the area based development was the uh, um, area in and around the ghats and in and around uh, the main kashi vishwanath temple now that area is old banaras with very congested uh, like you know streets with uh, like you know like uh, very narrow lanes like you know people who live there hawkers street vendors so when we did the citizen uh, like you know like interactions when we created the plan like you know based on the interactions with the people and interactions from the stakeholders it was very clear that you had to create plans which did minimum disruptions to the lives of people the ordinary citizens who were living in these old areas right so you couldn't do things which were going to okay you can't just like you know raise down that old area and rebuild that is not an option right so you have to think very creatively how can you include smartness how can you improve the basic infrastructure how can you improve the uh, water supply or the energy that is coming into these old areas with um, like you know keeping the constraints in mind right so uh, the basic infrastructure then beyond that goes the smart infrastructure right like you know so you're looking at uh, some of the totally new things that you can put into a city so your intelligent traffic uh, management system the adapt uh, adaptive uh, traffic control systems are all new kinds of solutions that you can uh, put in uh, without disrupting anything that is already there in the city right uh, the third comes like you know like uh, what sort of like you know quality of life things uh, do you need to offer so uh, i mean in many of the cities like you know they uh, focus on let's say um, like you know women's uh, welfare centers uh, there were uh, uh, like you know, uh, digital literacy centers which focused on both um, like you know certain social demographics and on uh, women and youth um, uh, some of them focused on specific industries that were there in the area so that uh, you could create um, you know means of uh, um, educating people for uh, like you know moving into the industries of the area so in agra for example like you know there's a lot of like you know textiles and there's a lot of uh, handicrafts and um, uh, like you know a lot of uh, uh, leather-based uh, products so the uh, digital literacy center would focus not just on general digital literacy but also on some of the skills which uh, to these industries and then finally like you know there's an element of lifestyle and culture because all of that makes a city livable uh, uh, and um, you know livability really depends on what do you do for the community so if you look at a city like indoor uh, like you know they um, uh, like you know several cities in fact like you know revamped their waterfront areas um, um, I mean like you know cities that had lakes they revamped the lake area and uh, ensured that they uh, created a lot more of greeneries walking cycling paths um, like you know fountains like you know uh, the civic infrastructure uh, included a lot of uh, um, like you know um, uh, security and surveillance systems in and around these areas so that people felt safe walking into these areas which had been derelict and abandoned for a very long period of time they sustainability like you know like how do you ensure that the waste management and waste collection and uh, like you know like uh, water treatment and all of that like you know can we include technologies around that uh, when we are looking at uh, these cultural landmarks or uh, social landmarks uh, so that uh, you know it becomes a sustainable um, like you know icon in the city so cities paid a lot of attention to all of these elements when they created their uh, designs now uh, like you know comes the most important thing how do you fund these things how do you fund and this holds true not just for um, you know smart city projects but all smart infrastructure projects um, when you're looking at uh, metro projects when you're looking at rail projects uh, highways ports dams like you know like all of these um, um, like you know uh, come into a similar kind of a long-term uh, model of financing so uh, you know if you look at there are some uh, projects which are high in value so any of the smart city projects that you can look at like you know they are sort of high in value like you know when you aggregate all of the components you're really looking at uh, 
you know, like uh, 200 Pro, 500 Pro, 1000 Pro, 1500 Pro, like you know, those are the uh, project uh, um, size values. When you're coming up with a greenfield city, the project size obviously like you know, increases um, even uh, like you know, it goes up even higher. And then there are uh, smaller sub projects which might be like you know, smaller in value. Uh, the minute you start looking at these mega projects, right, that's where the uh, like you know the different models of financing come in so um, like you know one obviously is PPP financing where uh, it's very important to structure it uh, well uh, a part comes in from the government but a part will come in from different kinds of uh, patient capital uh, investors and uh, these would typically be um, like you know sovereign investment funds like you know who would come in uh, these could also be in some specific areas like you know like uh, pension funds so if you look at some of the uh, like you know roadways projects uh, for example like you know uh, LNT has a group um, uh, where, um, I mean, like you know, one of the uh, major shareholders is the Canadian Pension Fund um, uh, for that particular entity of LNT. Uh, and again, like you know, these are uh, um, like you know, different kinds of projects will attract different kinds of uh, patient capital. Um, then, like you know, there are government sources. So the government sources can be from tax increments that a particular municipality can, um, like you know, like uh, uh, accrue. Uh, they can uh, asset disposal is again like you know, a very important uh, mechanism. So you can monetize land, and if you see a lot of like you know, like uh, um, uh, like you know, like uh, cities and government organizations own a lot of land. So. Um, I mean, for example, if you see the privatization of the airports, which happened uh, through and uh, right now, like you know, all of the new six airports that have gone to Adani. Uh, so the differentiating factor, like, you know, like uh, beyond other things, like, you know, the uh, thing that they did differently in their bid was that they looked at the land around the airports and they figured out, like, you know, a way of how that land could be monetized. Whereas the other people who bid for this, looked at only the airport infrastructure and the airport monetization they didn't look at the land monetization around like you know uh, around the airports for example a lot of the um, roadways projects actually attract uh, investors because there is an easier way of monetization right like you know through toll collections through uh, and rights around uh, like in you know, a specific pockets of the road it becomes easier to monetize the uh, roadways if you look at some of the uh, like in you know, a new announcements from indian railways again like in you know, a part of that uh, like in you know, the efforts that they are doing uh, will consider monetization of land that they own in uh, like in you know, different parts so asset disposal is again like you know like an important uh, way in which uh, such projects get uh, like, you know, like uh, uh, supported and monetized. And then finally, like you know, federal grants, which is like you know, where the government of India and especially like you know, all of the 100 uh, cities, the money that came in for the first phase of projects which have taken off the ground have really come in from government of India, creating grants and giving it out to the cities through uh, the SPVs that were created. Right. Now, uh, uh, some of the other mechanisms that have uh, emerged is uh, that um, like, you know, there can be uh, I mean, there's debt capital, but also like you know, municipal bonds and several cities like you know, about 15 Pune was the first one. But now about 15 cities have uh, raised money through municipal bonds in India. But that means that the city needs to be cash positive. Right. And uh, most cities in India are not cash positive. So municipal bonds is an option that is available to uh, a few cities and they have exercised that option at this point of time. So looking at like, you know, where are we now? Um, so if you see uh, like, you know, five, uh, like, you know, years ago, the mission got announced uh, about a year, year and a half later, once the plans uh, like, you know, started coming in, I mean, like, you know, the initial amount was okay, like, you know, it was going to be in trillions of uh, dollars. Uh, um, I mean, uh, like, you know, the projects that got outlined were about 200,000 crores worth of projects of these, um, you know, roughly 75% uh, of those got tendered. Uh, from those, uh, like, you know, about half of, like, you know, the total goal, uh, um, like, you know, uh, 128,000 crore worth of projects actually got awarded, right? So, uh, and of those, 
a much smaller fraction uh, let's say about uh, 20 uh, like you know like uh, a small fraction of the whole is actually uh, what's been completed and if you see what's been completed like you know these are projects around smart roads uh, around mobility and transportation systems uh, different kinds of like you know urban greens and urban redesign urban revitalization kind of projects smart water projects uh, solar system uh, like you know like um, uh, uh, solar pv kind of projects where like you know you're putting in um, uh, uh, solar power into cities and uh, like an you know, integrated control and command centers so this is what has actually happened off the ground uh, where did we go wrong i think uh, many many different lessons from different uh, areas i think um, we've been uh, very uh, lucky with agra because uh, agra um, you know pretty much has been in the top one two three four five uh, uh, like in you know, a rated city as far as the smart cities mission goes for the last um, like you know like uh, a couple of years since this uh, mission has started monitoring like you know completion and implementation uh, like you know uh, uh, completion and uh, it requires a lot of different things like you know it needs like you know that the tenders need to happen correctly in time uh, the implementation needs to be managed well and uh, then like you know that really leads to uh, the completion of these projects right? Um, we can talk like you know more through the pitfalls like you know as uh, through questions and answers but uh, clearly like you know there are some uh, lessons to be learned on how uh, like you know projects uh, need to be managed and project structuring is a very important part of it um, so um, and when I say project structuring like you know really understand uh, what are the components of the project what technology components go in there what is the bill of quantities what cost and budgeting estimate what is the upfront capex what is the ongoing like an you know, opex requirement how will this project be managed like you know like so it needs to be such that uh, people actually bid for it right so um, the way the bidding happens like you know, how can you if you are looking to participate how can you participate so it clearly works through partnerships it clearly works through an ecosystem uh, there are a handful of like you know like uh, 15 20 companies uh, which are uh, master system integrators these will be the large construction or the large services companies so somebody like a Honeywell uh, um, somebody like a Shakurji Palanji uh, somebody like an LNT and so on are companies which come in as a master system integrator they uh, will then like you know bring in all of the other uh, sub integrators or the other technology companies the technology companies like a Cisco will only provide its routers like you know uh, Microsoft might only provide its uh, like you know like a, a platform or uh, uh, somebody else might just provide data centers so uh, like you know the way the projects gets uh, stitched together is that there will be lots of uh, functions so when I say a function like you know, it would be let's say if you're looking at uh, uh, an intelligent traffic management system uh, you will have uh, things like um, uh, cameras you will have like you know like uh, uh, um, edge uh, units you'll have like you know like uh, the uh, uh, cabling and the gateways uh, like you know that is uh, needed uh, for uh, like you know high density uh, high quality uh, uh, you need a lot of information and uh, infrastructure at the uh, uh, command and control center level, at the cloud level, and so on. And each one of these might be provided by a different uh, provider, by a different component, uh, like a you know, provider. So the camera company is different from the company that uh, puts together the uh, edge gateway is different from the company that is pro uh, providing uh, the network connectivity from the edge to the uh, command and control center and so on right so there's uh, people who've um, like you know focused on different things and there was room at the uh, like you know like uh, uh, start for um, startups to actually provide components because many of them were newer things which had never been done before Right. So uh, there were startups that uh, started specializing in putting together solutions for uh, solid waste management, right? Like you know, so, if you're looking at door-to-door -door collection and doing the digitalization of that, uh, the vehicle monitoring of uh, garbage vehicles, uh, management of drivers, uh, understanding what collections are happening from each ward, from the ward level to the major collection centers, from the major collection centers to the uh, like, disposal centers and so on so all of that uh, element like you know got digitalized in many cities and startups like you know like uh, uh, it's, it's just one example of where uh, startups played a role
role and like you know there have been uh, multiple other pockets where startups have um, like you know provided solutions and again the way to do it is through partnerships because uh, the front to the city is always a master system integrator uh, the next uh, piece is like you know understanding that there is an execution and government governance landscape. So there is multiple stakeholders. There's departments, functions, and administrators, and a solution might need uh, the concurrence of uh, different departments and functions. So, for example, when we are looking at uh, an intelligent uh, traffic management system, which uh, like you know is really uh, putting in the uh, cameras with the automatic number plate detection systems, with the real time like you know violation detection systems, uh, to create the each alarm system so that like you know, and we all have got fines at different junctions, so we know what that system is. So that system actually requires the collaboration between uh, the city Nagar Nigam. It requires collaboration between uh, the city police and the city traffic police, right? So those are the three major stakeholders of it, and uh, like you know, they need to agree upon like you know multiple things, like you know from right of way to like you know where the placement of things are, like you know which junctions are important, how uh, this will be uh, monitored. Uh, in most cases, even though it is coming through the smart city project, these kinds of uh, like you know the traffic uh, police is actually monitoring this particular uh, like you know like uh, uh, element of the uh, smart city. Then comes like you know the whole implementation monitoring and here again like you know understanding how things integrate and how like you know like interoperability happens like you know, in data across different systems is very crucial and uh, this is where like you know sometimes projects take a long period of time because if you uh, like you know like look at uh, uh, like you know the first part you have a master system integrator which is really putting together multiple different components right somebody needs to understand how these things stitch together somebody needs to understand like you know what is the impact of um, um like you know like uh, uh putting in um x like you know different uh like you know cctv cameras at wide uh, locations on the number of like you know like uh, servers and storage that is needed what sort of like you know data latency should we like you know go for uh what is the frames per second like you know like uh, computation that we should look at so somebody really needs to understand like you know technology end to end to be able to uh like you know ensure that uh like you know the system is actually working fine so uh, I mean, this is where, like, you know, I think uh, uh, kudos to our team that uh, they've brought in, like, you know, like our team at Gaia, like, you know, they've brought in a lot of, like, you know, detailed uh, tech expertise to understand things at that detailed level, so that actually execution happens seamlessly. Otherwise, like, you know, if you have a lot of paper pushers which are there, where you understand technology, and I'll count myself as a paper pusher, where I will understand technology at uh, uh, a higher end level, not at the, uh, like, an actual uh, hardcore detailing level, uh, that uh, if you don't understand those details, projects will get delayed because these are complex projects where hundreds of elements are coming together in each com component or each service that the city is offering, right? Um, and then finally, like, you know, there's the governance uh, challenges, there is rights of way, like, you know, like, uh, I mean, in Agra, for example, we ensured that even as the project was taking off, we got the rights of way, like, you know, there are some permissions that you need to get from the central government, some from the state government, some from the city government. So you make sure that you get all the permissions in advance of any implementation happening so that, uh, you know, you're not waiting them. You're not endlessly waiting for these clearances to happen. There's a lot of change management that needs to happen with, uh, like, you know, I think, um, uh, yeah, uh, Yash uh, Avi, uh, yeah, yeah, with us. yeah, sorry, I didn't want to cut you off there. Uh, we're, 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 uh, we're, just okay. the information that you're providing is, is so, it, it's one so complex and so detailed. It's actually very helpful the way you simplified it for us. Um, maybe we'll do a few more slides and then jump into a few questions and do the Q&A. Um, Absolutely. Okay. Great. Yeah. Sounds good. So uh, again, I mean, like, you know, like uh, looking at the future, there's a lot more like, you know, that still needs to happen, both in terms of procurement, new projects, as well as a lot more of data analytics, right? And uh, if you look at uh, like, you know, what are the key drivers? It's not just going to be the smart cities, but there is safe city projects. There are Amrut, which is looking at uh, uh, water and sanitation kind of projects. There's Swachh Bharat. Hriday, which is looking at uh, some of the um, like you know, heritage cities, NICDC, uh, which is uh, the renamed Delhi Mumbai Industrial Corridor, which is looking at all of the uh, trunk uh, roadways and new um, like you know like uh, uh, industrial township 
gaps uh, which are going to come through and uh, many many different ways in which the government is improving like you know, including new things so municipal municipal performance index ease of living index these are new ways in which uh, cities are going to be um, like you know measured and monitored by the government and then this becomes a way in which cities will say okay i need to include uh, technology and dig digitalization and transformation so that i improve on these rankings and ratings Right. And then there are other elements such as urban data frameworks or uh, like you know, a lot more of uh, AI and analytics based goals that the government has where uh, like, you know, uh, again, like, you know, these become ways of uh, including things into the smart city domain. So I'll quickly actually like, you know, look at uh, like, you know, what's happened in cities. So, um, I mean, as I mentioned, like, you know, only 49 out of the cities have completed their uh, integrated control and command centers, but like, you know, like uh, a smaller fraction of those have completed uh, um, like you know, uh, some of the other projects as well. Right? Uh, when we looked at Agra, we looked uh, like you know at its uh, like you know the cultural heritage and its location to define some of its goals and its, uh, vision. From there, like you know, like looked at uh, some of the key areas, like you know, like the key goals around uh, greens and heritage promotion, tourism. Uh, livelihood uh, development for locals as well as social equity and like you know projects related around that and then like you know projects got uh, like you know split up and um, like you know created and crafted around there from there like you know it came down to okay like you know how do uh, how do we actually define each project right like you know so there were eight different components in agra and if you look at any of the other smart cities like you know there were out of the 20 uh, like you know, out of the 16 areas that we had seen earlier like you know each city chose like you know seven eight nine ten of these areas to focus on and um like you know some of the most common ones were obviously the integrated control and command center the traffic management solid waste management these were some core things that most of the cities like you know like uh, looked at right um and uh, like you know the whole idea was to provide benefits to pretty much all of uh, like you know all of the citizens some benefits to all and if you see like you know the, i'm just going to roll through some of the pictures of uh, like you know what has been uh, like you know done on the ground in different ways in agra from uh, like you know some of the things are on civil infrastructure uh, low innovation and some of the things were on uh, like you know like high tech uh, uh, elements right um, and like you know what happened interestingly in Agra, uh, it got labeled by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare in the early stages of uh, the pandemic was uh, like, you know, it, they called it the Agra model, where the city was actually able to bring together uh, the entire um, like, you know, infrastructure and technology that had been created uh, for managing COVID-19 response in a very coordinated fashion. And uh, I mean, some of it happens uh, through the will of the stakeholders. And when I say will of the stakeholders, most cities in India actually like, you know, depend on uh, the key people, like, you know, the CEO of the smart city, how strong is the CEO, how strong is the district commissioner, what is their will? Unfortunately, it is a people-led, person-led model in India still, and the cities that have done well have done well because there has been a key stakeholder who has said, okay, I want to make a difference, so I will make a difference, right? And the cities where uh, things have not fallen through, which have tendered, retendered, no implementation, all of that is where, like, you know, there has not been a strong city government which has said, I want to make a difference. So in Agra, like, you know, like, uh, and, and in many smart cities, like, you know, where they have effectively used the smart city infrastructure for COVID response, the question before that was, what's the benefit of smart cities at least that question has gone away so uh, now the question is really what next and with what next like you know where's the next set of funding coming from and so on so that's that's where we are like you know when we are looking at smart cities but clearly a lot more investment is continuing to happen even through the pandemic on smart infrastructure on roadways on uh, uh, ports and so on like you know and that will continue so uh, with that i think like you know i'll uh, uh, end the presentation and now, like, you know, open to any questions. Great, Amrita. I mean, firstly, hats off for <laughs> summarizing such an in-depth uh, and widely established industry in just a few couple of slides. So really hats off on, on the presentation. And the work that you do is really inspiring for, for all of us. Um, I think even with everybody being part of different industries, what you mentioned today plays a role which is pretty deep within each and every single one of those industries, right? And how it spreads across from the master plan, the top, very top, all the way through from small companies, startups working, like you said, a door-to-door -door management, whether it be waste disposal or water sanitization, all the way up to the top. 
So, I mean, with that, I think we'll jump directly right into the questions. Uh, Anshul, if you don't mind, could you also switch on your uh, video and unmute yourself? And then we can go ahead and jump into the chat. I believe there are quite a few questions that have come in. So we'll, we'll start off there. And, and uh, if it's OK, we, I think we may be going over a little bit over time. But if that's OK with you, Amrita, then we'll, we'll move forward. Great. Yeah, I I, th I think uh, your talk was like uh, very informative. I should say that first thing before we jump onto the questions. And I think there are uh, a lot of relevant questions that I see in the chat. So let me just start with the first question that we have. Uh, it's uh, Asha. Um, Asha, do you want to unmute yourself? I'll just. Uh, um, yep, you can unmute and 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 ask your question. Okay, thanks Anshul, thanks Yash, and thank you Amrita for a great, great session. Um, my question was around uh, the scaling of uh, these solutions across cities in India, given that, as you mentioned, every state government, city government is different, regulations are different. So how do you think about scale in India? Because we've all been in the US and US is all about scale. So how are you developing a playbook or are you looking at fully optimizing one state across all different cities and then taking it uh, state by state? No, I think, uh, you know, the idea, at least from a government of India perspective, really has been that it should be equitable and spread out across India, right? And it's really been dependent on the ability of the city administrators to push through things, right? Uh, so uh, I don't think from a government perspective, uh, there will be any differentiation that they want to promote one city over another. And you'll be surprised, like, you know, that, uh, uh, I mean, we might not have thought that Agra would be in the top, like you know, Agra would be number one at some point of time and in the top three or top five consistently because it's a small city. You would have thought that Bangalore would be there. So, uh, I mean, like, you know, not surprisingly, like, you know, some of the cities from Gujarat have been there in the top uh, uh, five consistently over the past uh, several years. So, Ahmedabad, like, you know, Surat and so on. Because they're good in implementation. They're good in, like, you know, taking projects through. Uh, some of the uh, bottom 20 are really cities which have not been able to make a difference, right? So that really depends on the city administration. The money that had been promised to each city uh, had been given for a period of time. The cities which have not utilized those funds, the money has actually gone back to them, right? Now, when you talk about scalability, let me like, like you know just differentiate a couple of things, Asha. Like, you know, when you're looking at, um, let's say, a project like roadways, right? Uh, there are two sets of like, you know, like that can be scaled at a different pace because the monetization is possible in a different way. So the first is that uh, like you know, uh, one set of long term investors comes in into those projects uh, during the construction phase itself. Right. And they uh, will be able to monetize when the next set of like, you know, like uh, private equity players come in who are doing, uh, let's say, like a you know, road asset management. So, for example, like in you know, a Brookfield, for example, in the last um, year has bought um, like, you know, rights to own and operate uh, like, you know, about, uh, like, you know, five or six different, um, like, you know, like, uh, roadways. And similarly, like, you know, other players, like, you know, are there. So there is different ways in which monetization happens. For the smart city projects, as of now, many of these things were not monetizable, right? So if you're looking at setting up the smart sewage management system, that was really not monetizable. Right. Where it was monetizable, like, you know, is really the traffic management system and the each alarm systems and they are monetizable. They can be scaled up. Uh, there's been a little bit of a struggle because, uh, you know, the money gets collected by the traffic police, but the investment is happening by the city and the Nagar Nigam and the SPB. So there's a little bit of a dilemma and a little bit of a, like, you know, bickering that happens, like, you know, between departments. Uh, but for sure, like, you know, there is a, a easier business case for scaling up in the typical business scaling up sense that you're talking about but for many other projects it will still need to be funded by the government uh, if you're looking at any kind of inclusion projects like you know there will have to be an element of government funding into it. Uh, okay great i, I think um, um, the question that asha had was uh, quite relevant and uh, I'll move to the next question, which is from uh, Professor Cray. I would uh, unmute you, sir, and uh, you can just uh, go ahead and ask your question, please. Uh, 
Good evening, Amrita. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, my question was, has the smart city effort led to more transparency and efficient government, government services and also responsible consumers who are socially responsible? I mean, that's what we need in India. And uh, once you have the data, which is transparent, it will improve both sides of the platform. So any comments? Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, uh, Professor Kekre, uh, thank you for joining in. Uh, so to answer your question, yes, uh, we are on a continuum. I'll give you a couple of examples. Like, you know, one is that uh, there is the whole, um, like, you know, like urban data exchange that has been set up where all of the cities which are actually publishing data uh, can share their data. And then the next level of uh, analytics and sort of uh, uh, cooperation can happen basis that. So um, I'll give you a couple of examples, like, you know, let's say if you're looking at the environment data, right, like you know, the, the emissions data, which is coming from different cities. So each city is monitoring emissions at different points. Uh, several of the industries uh, as per uh, CPC like, you know, are also uh, supposed are mandated to report their uh, like, you know, like uh, emissions and affluence. Uh, all of that data now comes into a common city portal from there. It can come into this whole urban uh, data exchange portal. Once you have that, like, you know, you have a national map of uh, emissions and affluence, and then you can do a next set of like, you know, like uh, solutions or um, like, you know, policy or what have you on that. Another example would be like, you know, like uh, when we are looking at the safety and surveillance data. So safe cities, again, is a huge uh, area has been a, an area of the smart cities mission and in itself is going to be an area in the future so the first of the safe city projects in Ahmedabad is like in a sort of uh, 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 in the uh, process right now of uh, tendering and so on now over here when you're looking at the data coming from uh, let's say like you know like uh, uh, the security data on people of interest and property of interest and cars and vehicles and people moving across the data from every city will connect into the state data so for example like you know like uh, up uh, where agra is so agra has its own data agra data is interconnecting into the up dial 100 data where that is the statewide uh, like you know like uh, uh, approach towards managing safety and security and that is feeding into a national database right so if you're looking at let's say terror right and if you're looking at a terrorist terrorist uh, moving from a uh, city and across state borders then this is how that data is effectively going to get tracked so there is some amount of it which has happened a lot more will uh, like you know the future is early stages yet um, not every solution and not every city has moved in terms of citizen involvement, I'll give you an example of something that we launched during, uh, like you know, through Gaia, we launched in Agra. Um, so, um, I mean, Agra being a small city, like you know, some of the e-commerce uh, uh, facilities are not as uh, widely available in Agra, and also uh, the city has been, I mean, like you know, it, it's been working very cohesively because of the set of administrators that uh, they have. So, what we put together for them was a citizen, uh, like in you know, a response management portal for COVID-19 for non-emergency response services, and they brought in uh, what is like you know, in the US, like your civil guards. So, they brought in the uh, uh, like you know, like uh, um, um, uh, so the civil guards tend to be the fourth line of defense, like you know, and these are typically like you know, retired army men, and uh, they uh, were enrolled by the city, and citizens could raise any kind of sort of uh, non-emergency request like you know it's not that okay like i'm i'm really i need a ven ventilator now so it was not that kind of a request but like you know i need medicine i need to be tested my neighbor is needs to be tested i need sanitization like you know, so things like that uh, were managed through this uh, platform and uh, like you know we used a lot of like you know, ai to ensure that like you know the orchestration happened seamlessly without any dispatch in the middle and uh, the correct person in the correct ward uh, got the information and they were able to accept these requests and respond to these requests uh, like you know like in real time so th this is just an example of uh, like you know what uh, got uh, done and how uh, citizens are also like you know like a part of the process uh, in uh, and citizens are part of the process in many different ways like you know there's a lot of like you know citizen engagement citizen feedback uh, in different ways which are built into the smart city uh, ecosystems so uh, a lot of that has happened thank you so much amrita
Okay, I think uh, we have a lot of questions, but we might not be able to get to all of them. Uh, I would just uh, ask Yash to put the last question to Amrita. Yeah, uh, Amrita, actually, if you don't, if, you, if you're okay going over a few more minutes and if the attendees are fine, then is it okay if, that, if we go over for a few? I'll just, uh, Amrita, I'll leave that up to you if, if, if that's okay with your time. I'm okay. Great, great. So then let me just quickly ask Rekha to join in and, and give at least uh, the closing comments that she, she normally does around this time. And then we'll jump back in and, and answer the, the, the few remain, the remaining questions. Uh, Rekha, could you jump in? Okay, maybe she's uh, <laughs> stepped aside for, oh, there she is. Yeah, hi. So are we uh, going to just, I mean, since we're continuing, should we do the closing comments later or? Sure, we, uh, we can do that too. Sounds good. So I could, I mean, or else, I guess in case, um, I think the only thing I'd like to say, because as some people may not be able to stay on, of course, a thank you to everyone. Uh, Big thank you to Amrita. Thank you to Yash and Anshul, of course, for the for organizing everything. And also, I just like to announce that you know we have our next event uh, on the thirteenth of May. So we'll be sending out the save the dates. It's with Ambarish uh, Gupta and Yash. Want to say a couple of words about that event? Or no, I, I think we'll, we'll cover it over over the messages that we send out. And we're okay. going to focus today because I see quite a few uh, questions left over. I think we should maybe focus yeah, on I that. Yeah, I just go back to the Q and A and uh, continue that. I don't think. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, Anshul, why, why, why don't you go ahead and ask the the next uh, few questions, and I'll jump in towards the end. All right. All right. So the next question is from uh, Dinesh Dume. I'm just gonna um, unmute you, and uh, you can go ahead and um, ask your question. Or I don't know if he's there. Uh, I I think he 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 left. But uh, I I can read that uh, read his question to you, Amrita. Can the smart cities be protected from future state government coming with regulations like providing fifty percent job reservations to local, like what uh, Haryana did recently, and can have major impact on business in Gurgaon? Okay. Um... So I'm not sure how directly that impacts, like you know, the uh, smart city uh, projects per se. Uh, I mean, for sure, like you know, if you're looking at the um, you know the employability of uh, like you know people, every city mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. till now like you know looked at what can we uh, do to improve the economic potential of the city. Right. That means like, you know, like, uh, let's say if you're looking at a Karnal, like, you know, you say, okay, Karnal comes from an agricultural, like, you know, in the area, there's a lot of agri and agri processing units. So can we do like, you know, set up an agri exchange, like, you know, can that be one of the ideas? Agra would be like, you know, look at, uh, like, you know, things focused to tourism and to its handicrafts. Uh, similarly, like, you know, somebody which is like, you know, like, uh, let's say a Raipur, um, because there's a lot of silk in that area, uh, it was uh, focused on, um, like, you know, both logistics because it's in the middle of the city and a lot of like you know, logistics passes through the state uh, but also through silk and some of the other agri products right so each city was trying to see like you know where do we create economic opportunities and hence create some set of projects around uh, improving the economic potential of the city um, so I mean reservation per se is an after fact so that doesn't really impact, uh, you know, the project at the smart city level itself, right? And then uh, the other thing also, if you look at uh, some of the trunk infrastructure of the city, uh, the water or the sewage or um, like, you know, like sustainable housing and so on. Again, these are not impacted by uh, the decision of uh, uh, creating reservations. I mean, where it may impact is that, uh, like, you know, let's say if they uh, create a regulation that the construction of these things like like, you know, need to be done by uh, like you know locals or if the uh, like you know like technology companies need to be local then like you know then they'll have a hard time like you know finding somebody but uh, like you know that that's said and done like you know uh, yeah it should not impact okay um so next question is uh, from uh, manoj mudgal uh, manoj can you unmute 
and please go ahead and ask a question. Amrita, first of all, my compliments, amazing stuff, very, very, very smart. And my quick question is, who will be responsible for running smart cities? Will this be like uh, smart city as a service for uh, some of the private operators or government is going to take care of it? Manoj, that's a very good question. And like, you know, that's the question of the moment, right? So if Thank you think you. about it, like, you know, like uh, the funding in the cities where, uh, uh, like, you know, was 50% uh, uh, by the central government and 50% by the state government, right? And we discussed many of these uh, projects are non-monetizable, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, there is no monetization potential for these. So where will, uh, and also like you know, the state, uh, the city governments and the city departments don't have the full set of teams, uh, specifically on the technology side to run and manage these operations, right? So the way the projects have been structured is that they are uh, like an you know, implementation for one to two years, followed by five years or seven years of uh, like, you know, like uh, uh, operations and maintenance. And that's the way, like you know, it gets contracted out. So the next time around, like you know, it will have to be a similar mechanism. If you look at water, and I'll give you an, uh, like you know, because water and power and so on, like you know, have been contracted first as uh, the non-tech, uh, like you know, contracts, like you know, like ten years back, and now the first set of uh, smart contracts are beginning to come out. So if you see, like you know, they were also contracted on a seven-year or ten-year term. Uh, with like you know like uh, people coming in like you know different sets of uh, like you know uh, people coming in uh, in a consortium or maybe as a like you know master system integrator bringing in a few people somebody who played a role during implementation and deployment somebody who played a role during operations and maintenance right? mm -hmm. and then um, I mean the major problem in a lot of these project structurings and the reason why many cities tried to tender projects but could not award it is because they did not budget it correctly right so there needs to be enough money for operations and maintenance for somebody to find it fruitful to continue for a five year seven year or ten year term right so if uh, you're structuring it in such a way that the payout is all upfront right so the person who's implementing and providing the infrastructure is collecting the money but there is very little left for operations and maintenance that's where like you know like uh, projects sometimes take off the ground so um, i mean that probably design and structure of the project is very important okay um, next question is from uh, ruchi uh, Ruchi, can you unmute and uh, ask your question to Amrita, please? Yeah, hi, thank you. Uh, hi, Amrita, thank you for that presentation. I was actually uh, curious, you know, about the entire uh, sustainability aspect when it comes to smart cities. Uh, you know, there have been a few cities which have been operational for a while, and I was wondering if there has been enough data collected that, you know, indicates that implementing the smart city framework actually helps us move towards more resource efficiency, looking at, you know, maybe reduced levels of pollution or air quality or even, you know, biodiversity maintenance. I was just wondering if there were any efforts in that space and, you know, what were the kind of results you all were looking at? So uh, lots of effort like you know related to sustainability, Richie. Uh, one is like you know like uh, just the uh, increasing the urban greens, and most cities have uh, like you know increased the urban greens quotient, um, like you know through uh, more parks or through waterfront revitalization, like you know depending on where the city was and uh, what um, like you know sort of uh, factors, geographic factors it has uh, it had to play with. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, like you know effort at least on the primary waste collection. Uh, and the secondary waste collection where uh, like you know like uh, the next set of work needs to be done is in the um, like you know like uh, uh, the waste management the full cycle like you know waste disposal and waste management some things have been done so for example like you know the waste to uh, power linkage and the waste to um, uh, I guess uh, 
manure and waste to fertilizer linkage has been set up pricing has been set up like you know mechanisms of um, uh, like you know like uh, procurement through this uh, have been set up so some of uh, those have started uh, taking fruit um, a lot more needs to be done uh, every city had a component of at least 10% uh, of their power requirement the city usage power requirement the city government usage power requirement needed to um, like you know come from uh, sustainable sources so they all went for a lot of like in you know, a rooftop and um, like in you know, a solar PV plants and so on so that has happened um, emissions like you know are being monitored pretty much every city is doing a set of emissions monitoring through the city plus CPCB has its whole set of guidelines which have become very very strict in the last uh, like you know like uh, two to three years and getting stricter with every passing quarter and every passing uh, like in you know, a month in terms of reporting and uh, that reporting now like you know so if you're a manufacturing plant or if you're an industrial facility you need to have a certain set of uh, like you know like effluent uh, and emissions uh, monitoring online systems which need to be reported directly into the cpcb's uh, like you know the state cpcb and the national cpcb uh, databases uh, like you know in real time and for smaller uh, industries it's sort of like you know like uh, monthly reporting and so on so there's a lot more that is happening clearly in that front as well uh, water and wastewater usage are the big areas where i mean uh, not much has happened as yet the first set of projects i mean like you know it's it's been you know water smart water metering has been one of those areas which has been tendered and retendered many times in the last couple of years largely because um you know the long-term paybacks for the people were not clear enough like you know for the vendor who's going to put in the money the private sector player who's going to provide the solution and run and operate and manage it for a period of time there needs to be a return on that money right and the way the projects were structured the return on money was not clear for people so people either didn't bid for it or they backed out of bidding right so uh, like you know the first set of uh, those projects are just now beginning to be awarded so there's a lot to be done in that area and if you see the um, like you know this year's budget uh, the largest fraction of the government budget in terms of infra spending um, has been set for uh, water and wastewater management uh, uh, so uh, clearly there will be a lot more happening uh, like you know in uh, uh, the future uh, in in those areas Angela, I thank you you're... so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Amrita. I think we'll just have one more question before we end the session. Um, I'll just uh, put Ankush on unmute. Could you please uh, go ahead and ask your question? Yeah. Hi, Amrita. Uh, thank you so much for a very informative session. Uh, I was just curious about the hardware ecosystem, right? I mean, in terms of uh, actual devices that capture this data, how much, uh, you know, is there an effort in that direction and uh, how are you know uh, how is the hardware ecosystem in general in india uh, to deal with smart cities sure so the hardware ecosystem i'd say like you know is a mix of uh, like you know uh, made in india and the global players right and in the global players uh, again it's a mix of uh, like you know people from uh, uh, like you know, the uh, the typical Western competitors, like you know, like uh, like a Cisco is there for routers, but there is an Indian competitor uh, as well, like you know, that makes uh, uh, routers. Uh, if you're looking at uh, cameras, like you know, like there is a whole bunch of like you know, let's say if you're looking at uh, 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 camera and cam uh, camera based surveillance systems, uh, there is uh, like you know the Chinese companies, there is the European companies, there are the American companies, and then there is like you know like uh, there are one or two Indian companies, right? So so there is like you know like oh, and and there are Chinese companies who have set up operations in India and they are saying that okay like you know now this is made made in India product, right? So so there is like you know the whole uh, gamut of uh, players, um, and. Um, yeah i mean like you know like uh, 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 hardware is actually like you know like um, uh, you need to have um, like you know past precedents of having manufactured and um, like you know like uh, 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 like you know like uh, a history of the product so many of these uh, people who were creating like you know either video, uh, like you know surveillance systems and so on uh, they um, were already in operation 
like you know, for other things before the mission came in. So it was like you know, easier for them to actually even sell in into the uh, like you know, into the ecosystem. If you're looking at software, if you're looking at analytics, if you're looking at uh, like you know a mini uh, like you know like integrator coming in to put together a solution with like you know hardware and analytics on top, then like you know that was uh, where a new player could have entered, and uh, they have entered because uh, you know you don't need the um, pedigree of the hardware, so to speak. Okay. I think um, we were 15 minutes past our scheduled time. Thank you so much, Amrita, and thank you everybody for joining on this call. Uh, Rekha, do you wanna just conclude, please? Thank you. Thank you, Amrita, once again, for uh, your time and for these uh, valuable uh, insights. I think you know we need to have another session to actually really cover. There's so much more to talk about. I think the session just seemed to be too short. I think one hour was too short. so. I hope at some point when we get together in person again, we can call you again and have a more extended discussion. But thank you so much. Wonderful insights and great learning for all of us. Many of us are not from this field, so this is a new area. And uh, I think it's it's uh, been very interesting. Thank you so much. And thank you, Yashan Anshu. Thank you, Rekha. And thank you, Yashan Anshu. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. So thank you, Amrita. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.